I have a uh, very unique title uh, today, The Power of the Purple Box. Now, this picture is, uh, I, I can't say it's perfect, but it at least will be a placeholder. Because you'll notice even in the initial picture, the graphic for this uh, message, you have three boxes. And obviously, I'm, I'm sort of bragging about the purple one, right? So it's the power of the purple box. But to the right of the purple box is a little diddly squat yellow box. And to the uh, left of it, at least we're, with us looking at it, to the left looking at it is the green box. And it's smaller than the purple box, but bigger than the yellow box, all which plays into our message. And yet right now, it just doesn't make any sense to any of you, right? And... Uh, that middle box is going to be symbolic of God's authority as we progress. And so I just want to apologize up front because technically it should fill the whole world, but that would be hard to put in a visual uh, way on the screen. So it is massive, it is huge, it is mammoth, it is gargantuan, whatever word could best uh, help you. But visually I'm going to have to minimize it but still make it bigger so you can see that it is significant, that it is preeminent, that it is uh, the one in control. So that's the power of the purple box. Before we get to that, I'm going to take a little uh, side road uh, first. I almost called this message trapped in the wrong kingdom. And even the prayer I prayed before we started, I'm indicating something. And that is that sometimes there can be snags in our life that I believe in Jesus, but it seems like the power of earth has a huge voice in my life. That the bait of the earth and the earth's kingdom has say, has sway over me. Well, I don't want to have the enemy have any say or sway over me. I want to serve Jesus. And so we could run some tests on you and one of them could be, all right, we're all going to go to Fort Collins right after uh, church and we're going to stand on a street corner and preach the gospel. Now, in, you know, just on paper, that's a very wise thing to do. You know, as a believer, it's like, yes, and let's testify of the working of grace in our life. And yet, on the practical side, you're going to notice that there is a resistance inside of you. And I can say, what is that? And there is a working of this earth in you to kowtow you and to train you and to prohibit certain behaviors. And it's going to say, look, you're in this earth system. And if you're in this earth system and you're going to get along in this earth system, this is how you live. And that is being trapped in the wrong kingdom. You see, that kingdom technically isn't the one that's supposed to teach you how to live. It's not supposed to instruct you in how to do what you do. And yet there's a correctness and there's a pressure from this earth system that tutors us. So even though we are believers in a kingdom that is so superior, so much greater, we still can find ourselves having little lessons and tutoring sessions from the world system informing us on how we are to get by in this life. If it's going to work out for you, if you're going to be successful in this life, you need to listen to the lower kingdom mentalities. And so I think all of us understand we don't want to be ruled by the lower kingdoms. We don't want to be ruled by the wrong kingdom. We want to be ruled by the kingdom of heaven. But how do you get free from that earthly kingdom? So trapped in the wrong kingdom. The word kingdom, you're going to see, just let's divide the word in half. King and dom. See, it's a king's domain. It is the domain or the territory of rulership of a king. And so if you said a princedom or an earldom, those are all uh, you know, f famous phrases from the past. It's a, the territory of an earl. And he has his estate and his borders go to here. But his earldom is still under the kingdom. And we, in a sense, have an earldom. And it's under a kingdom. And so our job is to make sure that we have the right king that is controlling our little dome as well. And so a king's domain, the territory over which a king rules. So there's going to be a word used in scripture. Now this is, you know, a choice of a translator because the word itself is not this in the Greek, but we're going to see in the function of a believer believing, 
when we believe in Jesus Christ, it has an effect upon our kingdom relationship. And we, by believing in Jesus Christ, by submitting to a greater king, are actually transferred from one kingdom into another. Which means there is a kingdom of darkness. There is a prince or a ruler of that kingdom, and he has an agenda for our life. And there is no way to escape that kingdom but by believing in Jesus Christ. And when we do, we are transferred, is the term. So it means to move from one territory to another. So Colossians 1.13 discusses this. He, speaking of Jesus Christ, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, or another translation says, transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So we ought not to live anymore as a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. Boy, that's an understatement. However, as obvious as of a statement as that is, it's interesting how we will still allow control of this earth over our thinking and our behavior, our feelings even. Our actions are oftentimes being dictated by a lower kingdom than the one we've been set free to participate in. So Jesus speaking in Luke 17, 20, 21 is talking about his kingdom. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that could be a very confusing statement, but the idea that Jesus is saying is it's not coming the way they expect with a king that is coming who's going to conquer and everyone's going to bow down in the way that everyone thinks the kingdom would come. Maybe in the end it will, But right now, this is a kingdom that is coming in a very different way. It's going to come by this man, Jesus, humbling himself, laying down his life, dying on a cross, being buried and resurrecting, and then ascending to the right hand of the Father. And no one sees what's truly taking place except for those with the eyes of faith. And when they turn to that working of that king, they are transferred into his kingdom. But it's a kingdom where the territory at first, even though Jesus is purchasing all, he is a ruler over all, he is king over all, all things are placed beneath his feet. We are his initial territory of purchase. We actually are the territory of the kingdom. Where is his territory? Well, technically he owns everything. He has purchased everything. All is his. But we are the initial foothold of his kingdom. This territory known as the human body is his kingdom. We are carriers of the king's domain. We are the king's domain. Exiting an old kingdom. So if you truly are transferred from an old kingdom... There's a proper way to leave it behind. Now, this is what I would say is a missing piece in much of our discipleship today. In other words, we may know intellectually that we've been transferred from one kingdom to the other. We could know the scripture from Colossians and go, yes, amen. However, we've never actually said adios. We've never said goodbye to the old kingdom. We've never formally just packed our bags and moved out. We sort of try and maintain a dual relationship, one foot in this kingdom because we want peace on earth, right? And one foot in this kingdom. I can't do the splits and that's probably a good reason. You know, I don't want to have to, I don't want to keep a foot over here. But we have a propensity to want a little of both. Okay, how can I play by the rules here in this kingdom and make sure I dot every I and cross every T when it comes to the kingdom of darkness, and yet at the same time make sure that I'm covering all the bases necessary in the kingdom of heaven. So exiting an old kingdom, you're supposed to say goodbye to old submissions. Things that you used to submit to, you're supposed to say, I submit to them no more. See you. Cutting ties with old behaviors. When you are leaving an old kingdom, you don't continue as if you live in the old kingdom. You sever that relationship. Severing relationship with previous rulers. It is an odd thing, and that's one of the things I'm going to try and bring up today, but is the power of the rulership and how rulership works in the lower kingdoms. Because we don't oftentimes see it. 
One of the stories I've, I've shared many times at Ellerslie is the story of anxiety in my life. So I'm a believer and I am going to yield to anxiety. And I, it's a very specific moment in my life. I was living in Michigan. I was trying to move with Leslie to Colorado. And that was, if you, any of you remember the story, that was when I closed the rider truck. I was just exhausted, stressed out. I've been grumbling and complaining quite a bit that day. And then I realized that I never packed my grill. And I had no more room in the truck. And you know, you, some of you could just counsel me and say, just buy a new grill when you get there. Just donate that one to the new uh, people, the, the people that move into the house. I know that would make total sense. But I was susceptible in that moment to something known as anxiety. And it was like the enemy came up with a contract with a pen and he said, just sign right here. You deserve some anxiety. And it's almost like a plate full of a steak and the steak is called anxiety. And he hands you the knife and the fork. And he says, just cut off a nice juicy piece and chew it. Everyone else does. This is what you do in a time like this. And it's weird, but I entered into some kind of binding contract and I submitted to anxiety and anxiety ruled in my life for the next six, seven years. And I could not understand why I had such a problem with anxiety. But I was trapped in the wrong kingdom. I was set free from it, but then I willfully submitted to it. And when we willfully submit to something, we need to proactively disconnect because the enemy actually has no voice in our life. And that is truth unless we give it to him. It's sort of like when Jesus says, your joy, no man can take from you. And we're like, oh, praise God. Well, that doesn't say you can't give it. And that's precisely the key truth is you can give away the territory that God has set free. And for us to be very, very aware of the fact that this is legal territory and the enemy knows it. And he works in legalities to trap us and to snag us. So let's work with wisdom back the other way and say, okay, since this is a legal kingdom, I'm going to take the highest authority known as Jesus Christ, and I'm going to exert it in this direction and say, you no longer have authority here. So we exit an old kingdom, but we enter a new kingdom. And when you enter a new kingdom, there's a proper way of doing that. And that is to say hello to new submissions. And now I'm going to declare what I am submitted to. I'm going to establish ties with new behaviors. I am going to build a relationship with a new ruler. So I need to sever old relationships and I need to establish new relationships. I need to cut ties with old submissions and I need to establish new submissions. The dark they. Now you'll notice I very purposely didn't capitalize they. And that's going to play into where I'm going with this because they, we all know who they is, right? They say, but they uh, don't agree. But they, we never know who they is. Who is they? We know that we all have they's in our life. And sometimes they have a face to them. Oftentimes they have a leading face. Usually it's a relative or a boss or some, someone in our life that has sort of been the dominant they up to this point. And so, but they also has a cluster of people that have, are faceless around them. And it's a big cluster. It's like they, and they have power. They have a lot of say. There is a lot of uh, strength in they if you give it. And so for us, we need to recognize that there is the dark they and the dark ruling system of our old kingdom lives is that they. You see, that lower base system, that old voice, that old system we used to submit to, it still says that it has control over us. Hey, you can't behave that way. You can't say things like this. If you say things like this, they're not going to like it. And so that they will oftentimes control you even after you exit this kingdom. And that is precisely where there needs to be a cutting, a severing of relationship. But they still has a lot to say. But what would they say? But what would they think? But what would they approve? But would they approve? But I don't want to make them upset. This is a very, very common thing that we struggle with. And we struggle with it in various facets and ways. And it doesn't matter how old you are, this is not a young person thing. 
This is a human thing of whatever age, because you could be in a job and there is a they system in that job. You could be in a sport and there is a they system in that sport. You could be, get this, I know this is going to sound like a, a weird one. You could be in the church and there's a they system in the church of how you dress, how you speak, how you handle your kids, how you dis... I mean, there are all sorts of they's that are out there. And it doesn't mean that the they is wrong always. It's that it can oftentimes usurp the voice of God in your life and become it. It becomes God to you as opposed to God being God to you. It somehow can elevate itself, and I don't even want to say that it's trying to elevate itself. It just can because we submit to it in such a way, because we want to be approved by they. And that desire for approval is what is causing a submission to sometimes the wrong system or the wrong kingdom. Sever in relationship with previous rulers. Now, this is just a sample. Okay, this is just, in other words, I have a, a fill in the blank type of a thing on the screen. And I just want to give you an understanding of how we go about doing this. When you recognize that you have something in your life that has an unhealthy voice to you, it doesn't mean it's an unhealthy person or thing, but it has an unhealthy position in your life. And sometimes that isn't the, th the, the voice or the they, their problem. It's not that they're saying, hey, I want you to submit to me everything I say. It's that you have somehow cowered in some odd way in, inside your life to say, I must have their approval. And without their approval, I can't function in life. And so, whereas there is a positive version of that, of showing regard and respect for someone's opinion or for their leadership over your life, there's also an unhealthy version of it. In the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, I renounce any connection I had previously with, and you could fill in the blank. So the word renounce is like an unplugging of power. If, if this was a, a power outlet and we were plugged into it and we're receiving a certain amount of, I mean, that authoritative control over our life from this, then renouncing is to legally unplug in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, I renounce any connection I had previously with, you fill in the blank. It no longer has say in my life. It no longer can dictate to my emotions, my subconscious, and control my behaviors. In the power of Christ's name, I declare that this low-level voice will no longer sit in the seat of God. I reserve my inner esteem, my mental submission, my faith and confidence for the one that truly deserves it, God Almighty. So let's talk about building a relationship with a new ruler. So this is where it starts for us, is recognizing that when we transfer into this kingdom, that we need to establish a clear submission to the right ruler. Jesus, you are my king. I submit to you. You are truth. You are salvation. In you, I put my trust, my confidence, my faith. I formally declare that I am a believer in you, your work, and your power. I submit to the word of God in text as the chief revelation of your will, and I submit to the Holy Spirit as the one you have sent to me in order that I might not just understand the scriptures, but live them out with gusto. I am your possession. Everything I am, everything I have is yours. That is a submission to the rightful king. So any other submission along the way might have validity. There is, there is such a thing as submitting to rulers in, in this world, but the only way for that to truly succeed in your life is when you are submitted to the ruler. And then every other submitted relationship is under that rulership of Jesus and never a replacement for it. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. I really find it fascinating that line. So we are walking as children of the light. And one of the conditions of that is that we are to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Isn't that an interesting statement? Because what we have a tendency to do is find out what is acceptable in our other zones of life. 
It's like, well, what, what is appropriate uh, in the American culture today? Like, what is right to do if I'm in a public situation? By the way, if you study that, you're going to find that standing on a street corner in Fort Collins is not appropriate. That is not respectful. That is not courteous of the passersby. They're trying to mind their own business. You mind yours. Keep your mouth shut. Don't share your stuff with them. Don't burden their conscience with your stuff. It is inappropriate. And so this is what I find interesting. When you walk as children of light, you find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Not to the culture, but to the Lord. And that is a completely different frame of mind. You have a different tutor on how you are supposed to live in this domain of your life. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, which is that which is acceptable to the earth, but rather expose them. The heavenly they. Now you'll notice that I purposely capitalized the T on they here. Because we are actually designed by God to be controlled by a they. And I think that is actually helpful for us to know. It's not a problem with us that they has a lot to say to us. It's that our they needs to swap. We need to go from a they of this earth to a they of heaven. There is a they in heaven that has a lot to say to us. The heavenly ruling system of your new kingdom life. Now, this is the they you want to be heeding. But what would they say? Now, we could call the, the they in heaven the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it would be accurate, right? That's a great way of articulating it. But there's also very clear revelation that has been given to us. The text of Scripture is a they. What, what does they say? I know that's improper grammar, but that, that's to, to make my point. What does they say? And then the Holy Spirit. That's a they that is taking the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit's voice to us to say, here is our opinion. Here is our design. Here is our desire for you. That is the they. What, does, what do they say? So, but what would they say? But what would they think? But what would they approve? But I don't want to make them upset. You see, when you graduate and you upgrade to a heavenly they, it actually sets your soul free. So I've transferred. Why do I still feel trapped? So this is, I think, one of the dynamics that I want to touch on is this is a very, very real transformation that is taking place in our life when we believe in Jesus Christ. And because there are legal trappings that give the enemy place, is one of the terms the scriptures use, in our life, which allow blockages to enter in, it comes in and through the fact that we listen to the enemy instead of listening to the truth. And so if you ever find yourself submitting to some they form that is lowercase t, then you should cut that off and dismiss that relationship. It does not mean that that person is dismissed, that maybe you are submitting to their opinion too strongly. It's just that you shouldn't submit to it in a spiritual way. And you need to remember who truly rules your life. Have you ever spiritually canceled the previous rulers? Now, I, maybe this is me having fun because we as the church don't ever get to have a cancel culture, right? You know, the world gets that. So I figured we could do some canceling ourselves. And, you know, because that is not a bad term for what we do. We cancel out voices in our life and say, no, that no longer has say. It does not fit the culture of the kingdom. It is not approved by the kingdom. Isn't that fun? We have a cancel culture. Isn't that cool? Some of you are not too excited about even using the term, but I, I still am having some fun with it. So a list of my previous rulers, because as I think this through, there's, there's a lot of things that I have been susceptible to, and I can say still am, okay? It's not that as I get older, I'm 53, oh, well, no, I, no longer, I'm free, I never have any vulnerabilities to the systems of this earth. No, no, I do, just like you guys do. As long as we're in this human skin, we are susceptible, yes, which is why we need our God, and he is our are a great secret for making it through this life. Cultural popularity. There is a way, and I, I don't even need to really say much about this because we all feel it. We just live in human skin. We know it. But cultural popularity, there's certain things you do that make you look good, and there's certain things you do that make you look 
dumb. And the last thing we want to do are the things that make us look dumb, that make us look you know, odd and misshapen and you know, opposite. We don't want to be opposite. Ironically, the word holy means other than. And, well, you know, I don't want to be holy, do I? It's funny because the one who fills us is the Holy Spirit, the spirit who is other than the world. That's sort of scary when you're trying to be popular. I'll just be honest with you. And this is a voice that can have tremendous impact in our life because if something begins to diminish our popularity rating, it's like, well, if I ever did that, well, I mean, I would be rejected. Well, then we have a tendency to hesitate, which means we are learning and being tutored from a lower system as opposed to, but what does God want? And what if what God wants would cause you to be rejected by this earth? In fact, I'm just gonna lay it out there for you guys. What God wants for you will lead to rejection in this earth. It's the same thing that he carried. Jesus Christ carried this same mission and he exemplified the other kingdom in his body. And he was the most perfect man and the most perfect man was rejected. The most perfect man was mistreated. The most perfect man was falsely accused. He was hung on a cross and cruelly killed. Why? Because he lived out another kingdom. The very same assignment that we have, but we have hindrances to following such a God. I mean, God, I know you did that, but you need to realize I... I mean, if I did that, I mean, it would have this consequence, this consequence, this consequence. And of course, you just read the New Testament. It already knows that. Yes, this is the consequence that follows. Cultural expectations is another voice. There is a way that as a young person, I knew I was supposed to grow up. And I, I, it's sort of hard to describe it, but I came from a well-educated family. Well, I need to be well-educated. So I had to go to college. I mean, it's just, it wasn't even a negotiable point. And so even though I'd given my life to Christ when I was in college, wow, I felt the pressure to do it according to a system. And if you asked me, so Eric, why do you have to do this? Well, I immediately consult a they system. It's like the they handbook. Well, this is what the world expects of you, Eric. And of course, I don't care what the world expects of me on paper. It's like on paper, no, I've turned from the world. I've turned to Jesus. But inside, I still had this voice. And it was very, very loud. Eric, uh, you're going to look very abnormal. I still remember heeding God and leaving college to go on the mission field. But I was already accepted at Baylor University. And so I could continue my studies after I'm done with this kooky season. So even though there were some people that were concerned, I, I, had, I had it already in my hip pocket to say, but I'm going to be normal again. And then everyone's like, oh, okay, as long as you're going to be normal again. Now, I don't know that anyone had this thought, but I had the thought that they had the thought. So I wanted to have my ducks in a row so that I could prove to the world that I was normal, okay? Yes, I'm getting a little radical here around the edges. I'm giving my life to Christ, but don't worry, world. I still am somewhat normal, and so I'm going to be going to Baylor. Yeah, I know it's a Baptist university, and some of you are a little concerned about that, but they have a very excellent pre-med program. You can look that up. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going there for the pre-med, not for the baptist stuff, okay? In other words, you have these answers to the culture to try and mitigate against their downward turn or their scowl towards you. Guys, we're supposed to be set free from these things. What is the statement? That the gospel sets us free from the tyranny of public approval. That I remember reading that at this exact time, too, when I was going through the collegiate season. I wanted the world's approval. I wanted my relatives' approval, but I also wanted Jesus. Can I have both, please? And the key for me was I had to relinquish the world's approval. And I'm just going to be honest with you guys. This is very challenging for the human side of us, which is why we must say goodbye to these old relationships. We must cut off and remove the submission points that we have in the authority of Christ because they will control us for the rest of our life until we finally nullify them. 
Sports team loyalty, and, and I threw this in, I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe I was thinking about sports at the time I was doing this, because the Nuggets are doing pretty well. And you know, and it's weird, because I, am, I have totally been set free from sports. The Broncos no longer have a hold on me, I'm proud to say that, right? But it's, it's very odd that my emotions have been controlled by sports teams for many, many years of my life, even when I've been a strong Christian, even when I'm not even following the sports. If my team wins, there's a certain elation. I, it's hard to explain, but it makes me feel really good and brightens my day. It affects me, and I don't know why. Okay, some of you that have never been influenced by sports or never come under the influence of sports have no relationship to that, and you just look at someone who is a fanatic of sports like they are weird. But if you have been influenced by it, you understand that it actually can impact you, your day. So I'm not even following sports, but if my team loses a big game and I find out about that, it dampens my day. And then I'm like, well, this doesn't matter. This, this is ridiculous. Look, you know, they can lose all they want and I'm not going to be affected by it. And I still feel the effective, effectiveness. And this is what I'm saying is that can easily be a controlling element. For some people, it controls their life. Their sports team, up or down, defines their success or their status of inner uh, peace. <laughs> I mean, what a weird thing that is. As opposed to being fixed to something higher that has no bearing on this. This is going to be solid and strong and full of joy no matter what. A man I wanted to be like. Now, it's going to be different for all of us. But when you have a hero, when you have someone in your life that is investing in you personally. I'm not even just talking about someone out there, even though I'm guessing the Taylor Swift effect is, is something that could easily fall into this effect that maybe there needs to be some nullification there because this is ridiculous how we can easily man worship or woman worship in this case. And yet I had a man in my life who was a great man. And yet I found myself submitting, wanting so desperately his approval that I was controlled by it in a weird way. In fact, looking back, I, I can only say that that's weird how much it affected me. And when I was trying to live radically for Jesus, I was so concerned about his opinion. And his face was the one face that would pop into my mind. And that's, it's, I don't even wanna blame him, but it's something to do with my submission in desire to be approved that actually created a dynamic that actually hindered me. I remember my mom recognized, she asked me a specific question one day and I acknowledged it. And you know, it was almost getting me to the point of weepy when I was trying to talk it through. It's like, but I just want this approval. I just want him to think this way of me. And this wasn't my dad, by the way. Uh, and so she prayed over me that it would be broken. She said, that's just unhealthy, Eric. <laughs> That's not right. You can have a perfectly fine relationship with him, but you shouldn't have that. And it set me free. That's one of the reasons why in my life I've been sensitive to this is because I know how clearly it happened to me, even though I was a radical Christian. Jesus, I'm all yours. Why do I care so much about this guy's opinion of me? An industry's good opinion. So it doesn't matter which industry you get into. There is a propensity to want to have the good opinion of that industry. And by the way, Christianity can be called an industry too. I don't think God calls it that, nor does he set it up that way. But we can, in our own midst, have our voices or our gatekeepers of approval. Uh, the frown is coming. And by the way, in publishing, when Leslie and I were in publishing and writing books, whoo, that is a heavy duty thing. And I'm only imagining that in the worlds that I've been in, in the little subsectors I've been in, it's the same for you guys and yours. That there is a system of approval. Like if you're gonna be one of the top in your business, well, then you need to you know, dot this I, cross this T. And it is a weird pressure that you can find yourself submitting to that they instead of the heavenly they. The check off from the wise businessmen. This is, these, this is my list, where there are, is that wisdom point of the very, the wealthy ones uh, in your life. And sometimes in ministry, you want to have a relationship with the wealthy ones because they may catch a vision and be woken up in the night to give you money, right? 
I just want you to know that the worst thing you can do is submit to that and to allow that to have a voice in your life as opposed to the spirit of God and the rulership of Jesus Christ. And so each of these are things that I have had to have very clear freedom brought to in my life so that I can see straight, so that I can live well for Jesus Christ. Other options. Now, these aren't necessarily ones that I dealt with per per personally. And yet, I would say that these are probably even more normal than the ones I dealt with. And that is a parent's approval. You see, a parent, I'm just about to go into this, but a parent is a very, very important God-assigned position in a child's life. But sometimes that can be mishandled to the point where a child cannot function in the kingdom of heaven under the rulership of Jesus because of their parents' control over their life. And it does not mean I don't support the role of a parent in their life. However, I support something more. And that is the position of Jesus Christ in a child's life. A denomination's approval. You know how hard it is for that rogue pastor to say something uh, that needs to be said when the whole denomination holds the purse strings? Whew, those are hard things. A coach's approval. A friend's approval, a boss's approval. I don't care what it is. We could put it in a lot of different packages. It's submitting to something lower than God and giving it a God power in your life. This is not God, people. This is not intended to rule you as God rules you. However, that does not mean it's bad. It's the bad is in you elevating its strength or its control over your life. Have you ever spiritually canceled the previous rulers? So here's, here's a way of saying it. No more. I nullify your God position in my life. I renounce any controlling voice I've allowed you to have. So again, it's not that the person or the thing itself, sometimes it's malevolent, but sometimes it's just a good human, you know, that loves you and cares about you. And yet that relationship can become unhealthy in certain circumstances. Pastuyo. So this is a Greek word. And it's a word that if you are from, if you've gone through Ellerslie, you've heard this word. Pistis is the word for faith. Pastuyo is faith in action. It is the application of faith. It is the movement, the verb. And it means to believe, translated to believe. So to believe, to place your confidence in something, to trust. Now, what's interesting is what severs us and removes us from the kingdom of darkness is this action. This action when applied to Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we are set free from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the dear son. This is the very word that Jesus Christ is going to be using in regards to, I shouldn't say, when spoken of Jesus Christ, of how he is going to relate to all other authorities under God, to his father. Listen to this. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Here's the ESV. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. You know what that word is? But Jesus, on his part, did not pastuyo them because he knew all people. He didn't put his confidence in any voice of authority under his father. And it does not mean he showed neglect or, you know, like towards his mom that he was rude. It's that he didn't entrust himself in a faith way. He didn't give a God position to something that was not God. He can give a respectful, honorable, obedient position, but not a submission as if it was God. That position in our life of pastuyo we pastuyo one only, and that is God Almighty. The purple box, the green box, and the yellow box. You guys have been excited to get to these boxes, I know. So here's our boxes. And a box, I'm going to, in this message, liken a box to a space of God-given authority. Like I said, the purple box, if that really is God, should be massive, should fill the entire universe, and yet that's hard to visually uh, demonstrate. So the purple box is symbolic in this illustration of God's authority, God's word, all authority. Everything is set beneath its feet. So God's purple box is technically the box of all boxes. 
So I'm going to put God on that box. Now, you'll notice that the green box could easily fit inside of that purple box, and the yellow box could easily fit inside the green box. That's purposeful. You see, these are all zones of authority, get this, that God assigns. You know, there's nothing wrong with the green box, and there's nothing wrong with the yellow box. There is only something wrong with those boxes when you don't understand the purple box. The purple box is the one that makes sense of the green in the yellow boxes and makes them function properly. The green box, parental authority entrusted by God. Now, I could do other things outside of parental authority, like marriage authority. I could put that as a group because it's something that is clearly established in Scripture as a domain of rulership that has a rightful place. And it is a very spiritual revelation, okay? So it is a very important thing in the kingdom of heaven. However, I'm going to use the issue of parental authority because I think in this one it makes sense to us. It helps us understand because we are children of the Most High God and we have been prepared in and through parenting relationships while well, being parented ourselves to understand the role that God has in our life. So I'm going to put parents over on that green box and then the yellow box, I'm going to liken this to human authority entrusted by God. In other words... Just because it's human and it's in this yellow box does not mean it's wrong. It doesn't make it right either. Just because it has authority doesn't mean it's authority wielded properly. However, that does, if we are to submit to rulers in this world, that's yellow box territory. Okay, if you were to show a respect, like one of the statements is a slave is, is supposed to submit and show obedience to his slave master. Whoa, that's, that's not translating well into our modern politically correct culture, is it? And yet what it's saying is when you find yourself in a yellow box relationship, that the way to solve that is to recognize first and foremost that you are in a purple box. And if you're in that purple box, you're set free from any harm that the yellow box can bring to you. So I want you to submit and be obedient to the point that they never ask you to violate the purple box. If they ask you to go and pick up that firewood and build a fire, even if it's unjust, you do it. And you do it joyfully, as unto the purple box. You do all your service unto the purple box. And so when you're in the green box territory, even if the green box is not really that healthy, and if you're in the yellow box territory, even if that yellow box is rude and mean and inconsiderate, it doesn't matter because you're serving the purple box. And the way to, to do well in the green and the yellow box is to do well in the purple box. That's your secret. Jesus Christ has set us free from the unhealthy yellow and the unhealthy green by giving us the purple box so that we can thrive in the green and thrive in the yellow. And we can demonstrate to this earth and our relationship to it who Jesus Christ is. So I'm going to put earth on the yellow box which includes a lot. That could be a boss. That could be your political leaders. That could be uh, you know, just a system. Like you walk into a store, that store could be completely secular. However, it is their environment. It's not yours. Just because you walked into King Supers, it's like, well, King Supers is mine. No, it's not yours. And you can't just take their cart, stick it in the back of your truck and drive off. That's their property. This is their food. You have to buy it from them. They're allowing you into their zone so you show respect. You don't go hollering in and through, the, you know, running around you know, without any clothes on through the aisles. That is disrespectful to the environment of someone else. Some of you weren't very appreciative of my particular illustration there. Okay, this is gonna be rather obvious, you know, because I've already said this, but I want you to think about this in how it affects your life practically. The purple box is bigger than the green box. Now, that's actually critically important for you to know. The purple box rules. The green box is still God assigned. It's a gift from God. It's something he established, but it is submitted to the purple box. And the green box is bigger than the yellow box, which is a very, very important thing that is being threatened in our culture right now, where many in this culture are elevating the yellow box over the green box. 
And that is creating havoc for those of us that know the proper order that God has established. That God has established parents to be a priority point over the world. And even if, if your child is in a school system of some kind and the teacher asks them to do something or teaches them something that violates the green box, which violates the purple box, the green box is meant to stand in the gap and to say, no, this is the protection. A green box is a protection. It is a preparatory box for those of us that don't understand the purple box yet. You see, it's meant to show the provision, the care, the, the understanding, the wisdom for the, the child that is growing up under its care and to prepare it for the purple box. Understanding the power of the purple box. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, then to God you judge. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, this is an interesting tension that is coming up because this is a green box territory. This is something that the scriptures itself are going to say has established the priesthood as the caretakers for the ministry of the temple, the ministry of the altar. There's all sorts of important things happening in Israel. And these ministers that are assigned by God are going to ask Peter and John to not preach in the name of Jesus. They're going to ask them to submit to them and not to the purple box. Oh, whoa, because the purple box established the green box. What do we do? Purple box is always greater. And that's the simple rule of thumb for us to understand, even though it's really obvious when we're going through a message like this, it's not as obvious when we're going through the blur of this world. The purple box rules. And that's exactly what Peter and John are saying. It's not that they don't want to submit to the rulership of the priesthood. It's that the priesthood, if it airs and it goes off reservation from the purple box, I have to stick with the purple box, even if you beat me for it. I cannot violate the purple box, even though I want to honor you. Colossians 1.18, and he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. That's purple box language, guys. Jesus has preeminence. His word has preeminence. His truth has preeminence. His work on the cross is greater than any other man's work. This is the work. Anytime we allow the yellow box to function as the box, it removes the protective cover of the bigger boxes. When we submit to the yellow, when we find our protection, our salvation in the yellow box by us keeping the correctness going with this world, and we submit to that and we nullify the importance of the green box in our life, it's like, well, yeah, but if I'm going to survive here, I have to, I can't go with what my parents were teaching me. I have to go with what the yellow is saying. We lose the protection of the green, but we're also losing the protection of the purple. You see, it's when we submit to the purple, that's actually when we're protected. The very argument of the devil is, well, you're going to be you know, vulnerable if you, you don't listen to the yellow box. No, I'm vulnerable if I don't listen to the purple box. The purple box is where my protection is. So there's our boxes. Life in the purple box. So we've used the term in Christ. I, I know we don't usually say in the purple box. Could you imagine? I'm like, what is your position? In the purple box. It's a little long, isn't it? And the purple box, there's nothing profound about it other than I think of it, you know, the color purple being the symbol of royalty, the symbol of the, uh, the bruising and the blood of, of Christ, his covering for us. You know, so that symbol is great, but you could make it a scarlet red box and it would, you know, maybe even be more profound. But I like the royalty factor when I'm talking about authority. Here's life in the purple box, guys. This is Paul talking. He talks a lot about living in the purple box. For though I am free from all men, Whoa, 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 Paul. You're free from all men? Don't you have some relationship that is over you? I mean, yeah, but he's free from the yellow and the green in the sense of it controlling him. He has now been set free to be controlled by God. And now that he's controlled by the purple box, he can function in his green and yellow roles. Listen to this. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. He's been set free from the entanglements of the yellow and the green that can come. Because of the purple box, he's now able to function in the green and yellow zones of his life with excellence so that he can win people to Christ. 
That's an amazing statement. Galatians 5.1, Paul talking again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. He has set us free from the yellow and the green so that we can function now in the liberty of the purple box and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Do not submit to the yellow and the green as if they are God in your life. They are merely predecessors of a God relationship. When you have a healthy relationship with a parent, it is meant to prepare your soul to understand the submissive role that you have with your God. But a healthy parent knows how to train you in the proper way with governance unto Christ. And when Christ comes, like John the Baptist, they must decrease that he would increase. 1 Corinthians 10, 32 through 33, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. That's purple box talk right there. That in other words, your goal is not to violate the green and the yellow. You're not looking to poke someone in the eye because you're freed by the purple box. Now you're free to not need their approval. You're, not, you're now free to not submit to them in an unhealthy way. But now you can wash their feet and bless them and give them the gift of your time and energy with a smile on your face even when they bop you in the nose and spit on you. You're free to actually not supply offense to anyone in the wrong way. Romans 15, 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. That's purple box talk. Most of us, when we're living under, under the yellow, we are not thinking about anyone else but our own preservation. How do I look? How am I coming across? What frees you to please your neighbor for their good? Leading to their edification. That's what happens in the purple box. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The only way to do this is in the purple box. In other words, my goal is to submit to the rulership structure of our day, of our world. To the degree that I can live peaceably with it, I want to. I know some of you are you know, really wanting to fight back on that one. It's like, what if it is unjust? What if they're idiots? What if they've gone off the cliff? Yeah, if they, if they ask me to violate my purple box, the answer is no. However, if they don't, well then even if I wouldn't do it that way, I want to live peaceably with all men as much as it depends on me. The principle of the boxes, if the smaller boxes, the yellow, the green, ask you to violate the bigger ones, the answer is no way, Jose. All right, do you guys understand what that means? But if the smaller boxes ask you to do something that does not violate the bigger then we pull a Chick-fil-A and we say, it is my pleasure. That is actually how we respond. And even if it's not asking us to violate the purple box, then it is our pleasure to do it. In the green and the yellow territories, they're not God to us. The purple box is God, but it has set us free to now love in the yellow and the green zones so that we are not entangled with the controls and the puppeteering of those zones. We are now controlled by the Holy Spirit so that we can love well in those other zones and not be manipulated and controlled by them. 1 Peter 2.23, when they hurled their insults at him, speaking of hurling insults at Jesus, what did he do? He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That's purple box talk. He submitted to the purple box and the authority of his father. And he says, Father, I trust you with this. Meanwhile, he is going to demonstrate love, even when mistreated in the yellow zone of his life. Paul on the green and yellow box. So Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians 4, and th I'm sorry, at the end of Ephesians 5 and the beginning of Ephesians 6, right before the armor of God, it is going to talk about this exact relationship of the yellow, the green, and the purple box. Of course, Paul doesn't use that language, right? But I think you'll notice, and I'm going to skip over the marriage one just because it's a long section, and we'll go straight into what we'll, we'll say children and their parents' relationship. Children, obey your parents, and I could say it this way, in the purple box. 
in the Lord. If you're in the purple box, that's where you obey your parents from. You see, this is ultimately what you are designed for. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And he's going to switch to bond servants. A little, you know, challenging topic for those of us, you know, in our modern political world. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart so as to Christ. In other words, if you find yourself as a servant or as a slave, that you are to fulfill your role with a my pleasure attitude, but not unto just them as humans, unto Christ, because you're in a purple box. You've been set free. This no longer controls you. It doesn't define your value. You, for whatever reason, are here in this, in this function in your life. But rejoice in that. Because in and through this, you can showcase the kingdom of heaven in a beautiful and profound way. So you're not supposed to do this work as with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. It does not actually matter if you have a bad job with a bad boss, if you have parents that actually don't get it, don't get your Christianity and are actually rude and mean and uh, maybe even abusive. All of these things can be settled in the purple box. Every single thing about the purple box sets you free so that no matter what your circumstance in the green and yellow, you actually can thrive in this world and showcase Jesus Christ. The key for all of us is to not allow the unhealthy entanglements in the green and yellow to hinder us from a proper freedom and liberty that we are supposed to have in Christ Jesus. And so for those of us that have been struggling with these snags and these controlling points of our life, where the they in the small t sense has too strong of an opinion in our life and is swaying us and is steering us. Let's pray vigorously today for freedom on those points. That we no longer need to submit to that, but we submit to Jesus Christ, to his word, to his Holy Spirit. That is what we follow. And we can praise God for the amazing blessings that many of us have with wonderful green box cir circumstances that we grew up in or wonderful yellow circumstances. Some of you have a boss that is just magnificent, right? Well, praise God that you have that. However, not everyone does. But the gospel supplies a solution for every single one of us. If this country continues to head in the direction that it's heading, the application of this becomes more and more important. Because if it asks us to ever violate the purple box relationship that we have and the purple box truth, well, our answer needs to be no way, Jose. But as long as it is not asking us to violate, we still pray for our country and we will serve those over us with a happy heart, even though their intent may not be happy. Our job is to showcase Jesus in his kingdom. This domain is his. Let us Give it to him afresh today. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, listen to this. This is what we all know. This is in Ephesians 6. This is what we're all looking for. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. You know how we could say that? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the purple box and the power that it affords you. This is what we have been given. We have been given the solution of how to live in these bodies, in this world. Let's make sure we take it. Father, this is unto you for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. We need your grace. And I pray, Lord, that you would pinpoint those things in our life that need to be eradicated, that need to be broken, that need to be severed. And those points where we need to freshly submit, that we need to establish new ties with you and new submission points with you. Lord, that's precisely what we want to do. May you bring us to a place of action in regards to this message. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen.